We're going to continue in our series through the book of James in James chapter number one um, is where we're going to take our text. James chapter number one will begin reading at verse number 21. James writes, therefore, lay aside all filthiness. An overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious, and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading and ministry of His Word. Amen. We're continuing through the book of James. James has been talking to us about the qualities that it takes to overcome temptation and to endure trials and hardship. And he begins this text by telling us there's some things we've got to put off and some things we've got to embrace. He says we've got to lay aside the filthiness and the overflow of wickedness. Now, He's writing this to believers. And, you know, we, we, we like to act like when we're in church that we got it together, that we don't struggle with any of these things. But James is telling us that, that if we're going to overcome trials, we've got to get rid of filthiness in our thinking, in our conversation. Things that drag us down. Paul tells us that we are to think on things that are pure, lovely, of good report. That our conversation is to be godly and holy. But how much is what we say and what we think influenced by what we hear, what we see, those that we're around? Like Lot in Sodom, it says that he was vexed his soul by the iniquity that was around him. How much are we, even though we're believers in Christ, do we let all of the junk that they try to make normal by putting it in front of us in song and in TV over and over again? You know, it was offensive for some of the things that are very normal for you to see on TV now. Generation ago, you wouldn't see on TV, a couple that wasn't married. And now, you see all kinds of fornication and filthiness and every kind of sin that you could imagine. And, 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 and the enemy's trying to make it normal to us, to make, take the shock away from it, and, and to, uh, in our mind, influence us to not think that what's filthy is filthy. But to think it is normal. And James says that not only we need to put off those things, but we need to receive the engrafted Word. Now, Jimmy Ray could probably talk about this a whole lot better than 
I can because I don't know really anything about grafting. I could watch a YouTube video on it and, 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 and try to explain to you how it works. But if, you're ha if, if you've got an apple tree and you don't like the kind of apples it is, you can go and get a branch from an apple tree that's got some real good sweet apples and you can splice them together, wrap it and tie it together, and they'll grow together, that branch, until they become one. And James says that this is the kind of word that's able to save our soul. So it is the grafted word. It's not the word you hear that's able to save you. It's not because you hear good preaching. It's not the word you know. You could have learned and memorized a whole lot of stuff and know every Bible story, but it's not what you know, but it's what you have had engrafted into who you are. Spliced together, tied together, until it becomes one with you. And James says, this is the kind of word that's able to save your soul. And then he goes from there and he says, be doers of the word and not hearers. But he says that if you're only a hearer, you're deceiving yourself. Self-deception is the most dangerous deception that there is because if one person deceives you then maybe somebody else can explain some sense into you and you can figure out that well that, 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 wasn't, that, that wasn't right and I understand it. But, but the most dangerous lie is one that you tell yourself until you believe it. And James says that there's this danger about hearing and not doing. Man, we hear some good teaching and preaching and we're against this and that. But what are we doing about it? We preach about reaching the lost. And we like that, getting to feel bad. But what are we doing about it? We preach about how we need to love. What are we doing about it? Are we feeling okay because of what we've heard and not what we're doing? Are we excusing our inaction because we hear and believe the right things? James says, be doers of the Word. D. James Kennedy, great preacher, said, when everything is said and done, there's a whole lot more said than done. We do a whole lot of talking, don't we? We talk a whole lot about prayer. We'll take 20 minutes to take a prayer request and 2 minutes to pray. We talk about reaching out. But what are we doing? Now James gives an illustration here and he says, if you're a hearer and not a doer, you're like somebody that goes and looks in the mirror and forgets what they saw. Now by a show of hands, I want to ask, before you came to church this morning, who looked in the mirror? Who didn't look in the mirror? Did anybody not even look in the mirror? <laughs> so James says, you go and you look in the mirror, you got up this morning, you look in the mirror and you're like, man, I look nappy-headed. I look like I need to go back to bed or get another cup of coffee before I... You look in the mirror and for us guys, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. I mean, you might be able to spit and wet it down and try to keep it from sticking up, but other than that, there, there, there's just not a lot of options you got as a man. If you look bad, you're just pretty much going to have to deal with it. Now, ladies, y'all are able to do something about it. That's why all the ladies look good this morning. You looked in the mirror. You made sure your hair was done. You Maybe you put on some makeup. You... Why, to pick some stuff out of your teeth? You, you saw what the problem was and you took care of business. But James says that when we hear but we don't do, 
We're like looking in the mirror saying, oh, what a mess that is. And then not doing anything about it. But for some reason, we're used to this. I just wonder if instead of the way we look physically this morning, if you could see how everybody looks spiritually, how would we appear if we saw not how we got ready for church by brushing and combing, but how we got ready for church spiritually. James says, you look in the mirror and you forget what you saw. You walk. That, that's what being a hearer and not a doer is. I, you know, I try to, I, I do my best to go through life without making a fool of myself and getting too embarrassed, but it's really hard when you're me. I don't know if y'all realize that, but but I have a hard time with it. I, I started to tell Pam about something that happened to work on Friday. And I said, so I, but before I had this meeting in Cincinnati, I, I, I had a lunch with, with my boss. And I said, I had on a white shirt. And he wanted to go to lunch at Gold Star Chili. And she said, you don't even have to finish. Because I know you need to wear a bib. And I got chili right here. I don't know how you drop it down there, but I always get it somewhere. And it was somewhere where I couldn't cover, button my coat tight enough to cover it up. James says we look and we see the mess, but we don't do anything about it. So this is in relation to our sins, our struggles, our, our, our carnality, our, our, our fleshly desires. We hear preaching and, and, and it convicts us, but we go back into the same patterns that, 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 that we came into with. And James says that not to be a hearer only. Don't just get under conviction and have a good cry and then walk out and live the same way you came in. He said, don't be a hearer only. Like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. And so, so, so part of observing our face in the mirror and then walking away and forgetting, he says, we forget a forgetful hearer. We've got spiritual amnesia. This happens with preaching all the time. I've even heard, man, the pastor preached a great message. What did he preach on? I don't know, but it was good. <laughs> a forgetful hearer. But it's not just the commands and conviction that we forget. But sometimes we are forgetful hearer when we look in that mirror and hear what the Lord says about who we are. We hear from the Word, you're the head and not the tail. You're an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb. You are not defeated. You are not a victim. You are a victor. We hear those things from Scripture. You are healed and not sick. You are delivered and you are free. You are not in bondage. You are saved and forgiven. You are washed. You are cleansed. You are not guilty, but you're washed by the blood of Jesus. And then we walk out after looking in the mirror and hearing what God says about who we are. And we walk out and we forget what God said and live in defeat and live like we're the victim and live with sickness that He's healed us from and live from live in defeat and depression that He's delivered us from live in bondage that He has given us liberty over we live as if we forget what God's Word said how many miracles have we lost because we forgot what God said? How much bondage and struggle do we go through because we forget what the Lord said about our situation? That, that we forget. James says, 
Don't be a hearer. It's not just sins and conviction that we see in the mirror. But it's who the Lord says that we are. Who He declares that we are. His promises that He gives us. The victory that He has promised us. All of the good things that are in Christ that He did on His cross for us that we forget on. And struggle with guilt. And struggle with sickness. And struggle with depression. And struggle with bondage. When He said... If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Old things have become new. We forget when we're in pain that he said, with my stripes you are healed. We forget that when we struggle with the bondage of sin that he said, walk in the liberty wherewith Christ has set us free and be not entangled again to the yoke of bond. We forget what the Lord said. But it's not just the sins and the Declarations of what God has promised us. But we also forget the prophecies that the Lord has given us. We hear it, we, 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 we look in the mirror and we thank God for it and we rejoice. But because it takes a little time, we forget. We forget to walk in faith. About the prophecies and the promises that the Lord has said. Maybe God has given you a promise and you've heard it from Him. And you felt it in prayer. But don't forget in the darkness what God spoke to you in the light. When God gives you a promise, you hold on to it. When the Lord gives you a prophecy, you believe it. And it may not happen today or tomorrow. But you hold on and you walk in faith. And if He said, all your children will be taught of the Lord. And great shall be the peace of your children. You believe it. If He said believe and you will be saved and your house, then you believe God for that lost husband, that lost son, that lost daughter and don't let the devil have them but hold on in faith to what God has prophesied over you. James says don't be a forgetful hearer. Paul said to Timothy to stir up in your mind by way of remembrance. Stir up in your own mind what God has spoken to you. There are words and promises and prophecies and things that God put on your heart that you can now still have confidence. Don't forget what God told you. Don't get discouraged. In due season you will reap if you faint not. Hold on and believe the promise that God gave you. James says that who looks in the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. This is a process. We don't like that. We want it now. We want God to work like our microwave. And like a good drive through not like a Taco Bell drive through we want it quick. He said he looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. Walk in the promise that God gave you. Walk in the prophecy that God gave you. Walk in what the Lord declared over your life. Walk in liberty. Walk in the fullness of what He has. James says that this one will be blessed in what He does. It's a promise of a blessing when we continue and walk in doing. Not just hearing, but doing. Walking out Knowing with confidence God's going to do it. Walking out and knowing that they that wait on the Lord. That God has spoken and He will do it. He's the author and the finisher. The alpha and the omega. The beginning and the ending. He doesn't start a work and not finish it. He is faithful to what He promised. Then James says, if anyone thinks 
He is religious. He's going to give us a test here. And, and usually in, in, in Pentecostal service, you, you, circles, you, you hear religion almost used as a bad word. Well, I don't want to be religious. Well, James is going to tell us here what good religion is. He says if anyone thinks he's religious, but doesn't bridle his tongue, Now, James is going to talk about some sins of the tongue in the next couple of chapters. But here, he's just given us the principle that if you don't control what comes out of your mouth, you're not as religious as you think you are. If you think you're religious... But you don't control what you say. How often do we say things that are not pleasing to God? How often do we speak with unbelief, with doubt? How often do we allow our tongue to tear down and to destroy and to discourage. I'll say this this morning. Whatever you think of Joel Osteen or any other minister, don't use your tongue to tear them down. Use your tongue to pray for them, to bless them, to build them up. Anybody that's tearing down, James says, if you think that you got religion, but you don't control your tongue, your religion is useless. Hmm. Doesn't bridle his tongue, doesn't control your tongue to. Do you speak unbelief? You speak ill towards somebody? Is your tongue. Lash out in anger? Does your tongue speak? Maybe you don't cuss, but you know, we got Pentecostal ways of cussing. Have you heard? People say, well, I didn't cuss them out, I blessed them out. Well, it's just the same. James says, if you don't control your tongue. You get in gossip. You know, you know, we all know gossip's wrong, so you know, you know how Pentecostals gossip? I got a prayer request for you. <laughs> and that prayer request will lead into a whole bunch of tear down and gossip. James says, if you don't control your tongue, you can pay your tithe, attend every service, teach a class, vacuum the church, sing in the choir, but he says your religion is useless. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. Again, this self-deception. So James has told us that religion is useless. Now he's going to tell us what good religion is. He says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in the trouble. Now, we, we want to think that visiting, well, that, that, that's what we got the pastor for, to do the visiting. 
And then some pastors, they don't want to do visiting. That's what we got members for, is to do the visiting. But what James is saying here is that if you're if you've got the real religion, if you've got genuine Jesus in your heart, you need to be visiting those in need. James calls out here widows and orphans. But Jesus, when He talks about the parable of the sheep and the goats, He says that someone's going to stand before Him that day and say, Lord, didn't we know You? We knew You. And He said, I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. When's the last time you visited somebody that was in need? When's the last time you stopped by to help a widow that maybe is having a hard time and you brought her a meal Helped her out. James says this is pure, undefiled religion. Well, this isn't even how we recognize folks. We we, we, we recognize folks that do stuff that gets seen, but this is stuff that isn't ever seen. But God sees it. And James says that if you've got real religion in your heart, that you'll visit those in their trouble, in their need. And then finally he says, to keep oneself unspotted, untainted from the world. And when we, 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 we hear that, we, we want to think of the, 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 the big sins out there in the world. That we always post against on Facebook. That you hear all the Christian marches against. But how have we become spotted, tainted in our attitude? How much are we like Jesus? Serving, loving, able to be a friend of the sinner, but not sin. James says, pure and undefiled religion is this, to keep yourself unspotted. To keep those attitudes, those ways of thinking, that impure conversation, to keep those things from changing who the Lord is making you into. Pure and undefiled religion is this, visit the widows in their trouble. And to keep oneself pure. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If we look at our heart, Jesus said that in the last days men's hearts would grow cold. And how have we in the church been spotted and tainted and grown cold by what's going on around us? Just think of your reaction the first time that you heard about September 11th. That terrorist attack. You can probably remember where you were. What you were doing. What about, what is it, a half dozen or more that have happened this year? Does it still grieve our heart? Do we look at the family suffering in Texas and Louisiana? Do we feel the heart of God for them? Have we seen addiction and alcohol and depression so much around us that we've lost our compassion? Has our heart grown cold, calloused, Unlike his heart. James says to keep oneself unspotted. 
to stay in the presence of God so we still feel what the Lord feels and think what He thinks and, and, and our conversation sounds like we've been in His presence. Instead of us parroting the world around us, being calloused and cold. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. This is the test of what our relationship with God is like. It's not just the stuff you don't do. It's not because you can say, I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't run with those that do. It is, do we help those in need? Do we keep ourselves from becoming worldly? Are we more like Christ or more like the world that is around us? Are we more like Him? Transformed? Renewing our mind? Or have we begun to, like Lot, to love the place around us? And think we're okay because we're not as bad as the ones that are doing the sin, but we're comfortable. Spotted, vexed, changed from who God wants us to be. You know, as I've been praying, we've been praying for a long time for revival. But over the last month, I felt like the Lord said, quit praying for me to send revival. Pray that I prepare the people for revival. See, God's sending it, but we're not ready. If we don't get ready, the same sun that melts wax hardens clay. The same move of God that can cause us to flow in His great power can also harden and turn us away if we're not ready. So I've been praying, Lord, prepare us. I've been calling out Your name saying, Lord, prepare each one. God, prepare us and make us ready for what You're doing. We stand on the brink of it. We better hurry up and get ready. Get ourselves unspotted from the world. Get pure, undefiled religion. Not this mixed worldly cocktail that we've diluted and still call Christianity, but the faith that was once delivered to the saints. As I close this morning, I, I, I feel the Holy Spirit wants us to have a season of prayer and repentance. When I read these verses, it convicts me. And I hope you're allowing the Holy Spirit to convict you right now. Things that you've said didn't bridle your tongue. Needs that were around you that you didn't help. Spots that you've got on your garment that are worldly. Let us take some time in the presence of the Lord and the altars this morning and say, God, let it begin with me. Give me pure and undefiled religion. Don't let me continue to walk in this self-deception and compromise, but make me ready for what You're doing in my life. Would you come and let's gather around for a season of prayer.